Okay, uh, so uh, welcome to this next video on the heme group and hemoglobin. Okay, um, so we've now seen the structure of the heme group. What we now want to do is we want to see how does this interact with proteins? How can you associate this structure with proteins? Okay, and for the basis of this now, the way we will denote the heme group to simplify it and stop having to draw this massive great picture out is instead of drawing this massive great picture out we will instead draw a box like so to represent the porphyrin ring and then we will put our ferrous cation at the center and then have bonds like so to remind us of these bonds that uh, the porphyrin ring has uh, with the iron um, cation at the center right okay so this is our, how we're going to denote the heme group from now on Okay, now, the heme group is what is often known as a prosthetic group, okay? So, um, a prosthetic, if something's prosthetic, it means that it has been added on. So, prosthetic limbs uh, mean that you've added on a limb to someone, and they're replacement limbs, okay? So, prosthetic groups on proteins mean that you've stuck this group on the side of a protein. So... To, to label this point, here you have your protein, and what you're going to do is you're going to take this heme group and you're going to stick it on the side of the protein. That is what is meant by a prosthetic heme group. So this would be a prosthetic heme group. And I want to stress that there are other uh, prosthetic groups that you, you can add other uh, structures onto the side of proteins other than just heme groups but heme groups are a good example of a prosthetic group and when of course you do add on a heme group to the side of a protein that's called a prosthetic heme group okay so I want to see an example of how you can add uh, a prosthetic heme group onto a, a protein okay and this is a um, mechanism by which which is often used uh, you interact it with a specific amino acid, which is generally histidine. Okay, so uh, proteins then. We'll just talk a little bit about proteins. Proteins are polypeptides. They are amino acid joined onto another amino acid after another amino acid. So you uh, polymerize amino acids one after another to make basically a huge, great strand of amino acids connected to each other which is known as a polypeptide, okay? Right, now polypeptides can fold up into uh, quite complicated structures, and that gives the protein its, um, its native structure, okay? However, all of the amino acids in this polypeptide have R groups, basically. They have groups sticking out, and some of these groups can then stick out from the overall native protein structure. So let's say this is our protein. Some of these R groups, the amino acids of this polypeptide, might just stick out from the side of the protein. Okay? Right. So, uh, now let's have a look at one of these amino acids, which is very good, basically, at having prosthetic heme groups stuck on the side of it. And the amino acid that's good at doing that is an amino acid known as histidine. Histidine. Right, so let's have a look at the structure of histidine, then. Right, so uh, start off with the basic amino acid structure. Here's the alpha carbon. Here's the amino group of the amino acid. Here's a hydrogen off the alpha carbon. Here's a carboxylic acid group down here, okay, or a carboxyl group. Uh, and then off the alpha carbon, the final group is what makes the amino acid specific. So it's the R group. At the moment, this is the generic structure for all amino acids. What makes this amino acid histidine is that we have a specific R group sticking off here, which is a methylene group, then with an imidazole ring sticking off it. So let me show this. So an imidazole ring is a five-membered ring where you have two nitrogens, like so, okay? And uh, then you have this double bond between the nitrogen and the carbon here. And that double bond there, when you have a double bond between a nitrogen atom and a carbon atom, there is a very special name for that bond, and it's called an imide bond. Uh, so that's why this, overall, this ring is overall known as the imidazole ring. Okay, so you have this five-membered ring with two nitrogens like so, this imide bond down here, and then a double bond between the carbons down there. 
Now, uh, finally, you just stick on hydrogens where there are missing bonds. So one here, one here, and one here. And that's the finished structure now of histidine. Right, so why is this um, amino acid so good at coordinating, um, well, coordinating heme, heme groups, prosthetic heme groups? Well, the reason is it has a nitrogen here, which has a lone pair of electrons sticking out over here. Now, if we draw our heme group, so how should I draw this so that I can get it at a good angle, right? There, maybe, like so. Okay, so this is our square representing our heme group. And then at the center of the heme group, we know we have this ferrous ion here, and then we have these bonds coordinating the iron cation in the ferrous state. So two covalent bonds and these two um, interactions that are just between the lone pairs and the uh, positive charge on the iron. Now, what we can have is this lone pair of electrons on this nitrogen can form basically a fifth coordinate bond with that iron uh, cation there. So basically, you can now get a fifth coordinate bond. Okay, and now what you have is this prosthetic group, this prosthetic heme group down here. This is the prosthetic heme group. This is basically linked um, onto uh, the protein via this histidine atom, which is linking, well, which is bound now to the iron um, cation at the center of the prosthetic heme group. And that's basically how you can stick um, prosthetic heme groups onto proteins. That's an example of how you can do it. And histidine is often used. Um, the example that we're going to see in upcoming videos is uh, the soluble guanylate cyclase enzyme, where most definitely you have a histidine um, residue uh, coordinating this ion uh, cation at the center of a prosthetic heme group that then sticks on the side of the soluble guanylate cyclase enzyme. Okay, right. So, uh, now we've discussed how we can stick heme groups onto the sides of proteins and get prosthetic heme groups. Let's discuss hemoglobin, the archetypal example of a protein with a prosthetic heme group. Uh, so, hemoglobin, again, if you're an American, um, if you're, well, if you're using American English, um, you will uh, write this as hemoglobin, like so. If you're using British English, you'll write this as hemoglobin, like so. Okay, and both are equally acceptable. Okay, right, although obviously the American one's probably now dominating um, because America dominates. Uh, so, um, hemoglobin and hemoglobin, whichever way you want to spell it, um, the structure of hemoglobin is that it's made up of four subunits. So, I'll draw it here. So, this is the hemoglobin protein. And basically, it's made up of four um, protein subunits. Okay, so I'll divide it into four. Okay, so two of these proteins, so we'll have these two up here, are known as alpha globins. Okay, so you have two alpha globins, and we'll put them like so. Two alpha globins, and two beta globins. Beta globins. So there are these two proteins known as alpha globin and beta globin, and you're basically making a tetramer of alpha globin and beta globin, and that is the protein structure that's going to underlie hemoglobin. Now, in order to actually turn this into hemoglobin, we need these heme groups added on. So what we're going to do is we're going to stick on prosthetic heme groups to every single one of the subunits of hemoglobin. So here we have the um, four prosthetic heme groups stuck onto hemoglobin. Right, so um, I'll highlight them in pink. So these are the prosthetic heme groups drawn as these planar um, squares again to represent the porphyrin rings. And then I might put some um, orange atom at the center to represent the ferrous cation. So right at the center is the ferrous cation. Uh, with this double divalent positive charge, okay? So, and then you've got these little bonds coordinating them, etc. So I'll just draw that. Well, actually, I'll draw it for all of them, okay? So, basically, hemoglobin now, overall, has these four heme groups uh, which are attaching this, um, uh, well, which are attached to the, each one of, well, attached 
to uh, one attached to each of the uh, four protein subunits of hemoglobin. Right, now, the way in which they are going to be attached is that one of the, um, the fa they, they're going to have a fifth coordinate link going into the page with the protein subunit. However, that still leaves one final coordinate link coming out of the page, the sixth coordinate link. And basically, what can happen is, if I um, draw this sort of like here, so I've taken one of these out, um, here's the ferrous cation at the centre now. Okay, um, here's our porphyrin ring in this purple colour here. Okay, now the uh, fifth coordinate bond is going down below and is attaching to the protein subunit below. So this is the globin down here. Okay, right. So now what can happen is the oxygen atoms here those have lone pairs of electrons and they can form the sixth coordinate link with this ferrous cation uh, at the center of this porphyrin ring. So overall you can get si uh, sorry, four uh, oxygen atoms binding to a hemoglobin molecule, one to each of these four um, prosthetic heme groups.